Ladybird. Ladybird. Where's Ladybird? One pack of camel lights, a scratcher, and a playgirl. ID. It's my birthday today. Is that your given name? It's given to me by me. I think we're done with the learning portion of high school. What you do is very baller. I was on top. Who the fuck is on top their first time? Lady Bird now playing. I am from beyond. Listen, and all you desire will be yours. Welcome to Spider-Man and the Secret Wars. Prepare for battle. It was a defensive exercise. Yeah, best defense is a good offense. Or is it the other way around? Welcome to Prattle World. I am your host, the ever-amazing, ever-spectacular Spider-Dan. And in this podcast, I spotlight entertainment's best-kept secrets that a mainstream audience may find boring. And welcome to Secret Defenders, where I task my guests to defend their favourite movies that are underrated, infamous, or obscure. And for the first time ever... We're having a Femme on Invasion all of the way. We have two founding members of the Femme on Collective podcast defending Lady Bird. And Lady Bird is the word. The bird, 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 bird is the word. And we're going to find out why people should see it if they haven't and why you should get on board because we are recording this the day Greta Gerwig releases her magnum opus, Barbie into the world. So for the first time, we have Alison Shelton. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk about the wonders of Lady Bird. Absolutely. We're gonna we're all gonna spread our wings and fly and soar. That's right. Uh, Let's into, go. Bird puns. Yes, all the bird puns. I mean, I I mean, I was expecting. I read. I did no research, so I was expecting a Cronenbergian, you know, woman bird avian hybrid thing going on. Uh, uh-huh. Who knows what, you know, who knows what I was expecting, but we got something entirely different. And we also have everyone's hater of the Russian people and uh, and dogs <laughs> and dogs as well. Don't forget, she hates dogs as well. That's uh, not true. I'd like to. <laughs> she hates the, the patriarchy. She I hates the patriarchy. patriarchy. Don't we all? And yeah. what yes. I find interesting about the human race is we often get more upset when dogs die than we do when actual human beings die. So that was just something I was positing in our last podcast. So don't start tarnishing me. I'm not, I'm not. I, I mean I'm I'm all I was all on board with what you were saying. It just the way it was just the way it came out, I think, was just fuck them and these things. It was in the rear fashion of the bluntest object you can find. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and I'd like to say also, sure. in this film, you do get a hybrid woman and a bird, her mm-hmm. campaign posters. You so do, she's yeah. Not talking about the ladybird, as oh. in the ladybug, she, which I remember the first time I watched, I was like, I presumed yeah. it was about the ladybird bug, but it is not. She <laughs> has a bird's head on her body and then her a bird's body in her head. That Fantastic. Yeah. And it scares nuns. It it, it terrifies them. They're very Very, sensitive. Very sensitive. (laughs) Uh, Before we get too off track. um, Yeah, the the movie's not about that. No, it's not about that. But but, but there's things. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. Um, So, (laughs) Alison, you suggested this film. And again, it's very different from from what I usually do, the kind of stuff that's usually... That's what I'm here for. Absolutely. I felt I felt a certain responsibility to talk about a female director because that's what I am. And I feel like we don't talk about them enough. And this movie, I loved an excuse to watch it again because you have a very complete list of films to choose from. Yes. I was like completely overwhelmed and I had to stop myself from texting you. I can't believe you haven't watched this a hundred times. That didn't yes. seem like a fruitful <laughs> thing to do. So I didn't do it. But when I saw that you hadn't watched this, I, I am a big fan of Greta Gerwig and have been since like back in the, you know, day. This movie is a coming of age story, which I think most of us have space in our hearts for coming of age stories because we all came of age, some of us better than others and or more <laughs> completely than others. And Sergio Ronan, the whole cast is is pitch perfect. 
And I am a Californian where this film is set. And I loved seeing a film about Sacramento, which is a very underrepresented part of the state media wise. So it was fun to see that. I love everything about it pretty much, but it's, it's a really like well done coming of age story is what I would say about it. Yes. And many people would agree with you. This yes, may, may be, not... this may be not be that infamous, obscure, underrated as a film, but I hadn't seen it. And you know, That's I, right. I had, I <laughs> was not very well versed in it. I don't, I'll be honest. I'm not one for kind of. I know. I know. Mike and Megan. Megan is very much like against the weird stuff. The weird, which is quite like the extreme, odd, violent. Maybe for me, it's like quirky, odd indie movies. That's my weird. That I'm kind of a little bit like. I kind of like. Eh, eh, no, no, maybe not. For I think me. they've lost favor over the past couple hmm. of decades. I think there was a lot more of, of them, and they were like successful cinematically and. Um, but I think this is actually not too quirky. I don't think it's twee. It's not like Garden State. I think it's grounded in, I mean, not that Garden State's not a lovely movie to everyone who went to college with Zach Braff like me, but <laughs> I just think this movie is, um, it's, it, I just, it's, it, it's the word, give it to me, Rhea. You know, it transcends, it transcends the category, I think. There we go. There we go. I, well, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's very it's it's um it's exactly not the kind of quirky and, and oddball and f- weird for the sake of being weird like exactly oh, I'm being cookie and we're being That's... strange it's there's there's a nice kind of there's a middle ground because there are moments where sh- where Ladybird is kind of overtly quirky and says mm-hmm. things to be a certain way or represent herself in a certain way but also there's still like she's still a real person underneath that. And you can still yeah. see who she is, you know, and the quirks are quite charming in a way when we know what, you know, what her objective is through those quirks, I think. Um, but yeah, why don't, why don't you tell us, uh, Rhea, what, what do you think, actually? Because we've not heard your thoughts on on Lady Bird. Um, I, I imagine they echo Alison's. <laughs> I'm, I'm just enjoying, I'm just enjoying the chat a lot. I think what you're saying, Dan, is about, she has quirks but I think that's very authentic to a 17 18 year old who wants to be a bit different who wants the world to see them a bit different who's trying to find their place in the world and for me that's why this film's so enjoyable because I remember being that age and feeling like that and doing quirky things but also not really knowing who I was and being like is this who I am is that who I am I don't know I'm just going to do this thing and try it out and see what happens and you know in teen drama stakes it's usually pretty devastating as we see you know with her friendship groups with her love interests but in the bit this film does it realistically it's not you know a John Tucker must die which is a film I really enjoy by the way but you know it's sort of like that revenge teen sort of comedy jokey thing this is a this is a comedy film but it it is very much grounded in that reality and those feelings I think not just teenage girls feel but all teenagers feel and that's why I think it's got such a broad audience and as you've both touched on the performances are just absolutely amazing this came out in 2017 I hadn't yet had a child and I was all like I I totally identify (laughs) with a lady bird I remember being that age uh it's making me cringe about some things I did that age. Plus her mum is, you know, I was like, her mum is a completely complex character, but I'm definitely more on Ladybird's side. Now I have a child and I am like, oh yeah, it's, I hate it. I hate it when parents say that to you. You go, when you have a child, you'll see things differently. You'll interpret things differently. And it turns out it happens. I'm not saying you can't feel those things or understand those things when watching something if you don't have children, because that is a bullshit argument. But it just hits slightly differently. And I've been doing a lot of self-reflection on how I was brought up on how I was parented and how I parent. And so just Lady Ladybird's mum, Laurie Metcalf's character is just so interesting to me. <laughs> and I could just watch the, the two of them on screen just all day long, just doing as they are day to day things, because I I think we rarely get to see these complex mother daughter relationships on screen, especially so well written and so well acted. And it's just like it's fantastic. I'm hanging on every single word that they're saying. And so much they're so often they're saying 
nothing but so much at the same time. And it's just so true. <laughs> yeah, it, re- it really makes me reflect on the conversations I've had with my mother in my life and what I'm sure are conversations I'll be having with my child when when they're a bit more grown up. So I just, this is a film, Jess does literature for life about um, books you could revisit throughout your life. This is a film, I think, that is one that I constantly revisit. I almost didn't rewatch it for this chat because I've seen it so many times. I was like, I don't need it. But I thought, oh, what a shame. I've got to watch Lady Bird. So, <laughs> so yeah, so turns out I love it. Shocking. What a shocker. Uh um so yeah it's uh it's I'll, I'll I'll be honest I again coming into this I'm you know I I have an open mind I never I never kind of close myself off to experiences I you know I and a very open mind I will literally watch anything you know bar maybe a snuff movie and don't worry this is nowhere near my feelings are nowhere near like that it's not like oh god this is horrible to watch I I really actually I am not I was not brought up Catholic. I didn't go to Catholic school. I was not brought up in Sacramento. I'm not a young lady at the at the turn of the you know early 2000s, but I was a young man in school, and I had a, a lot of this brought up a lot of kind of memories for me, not just the kind of stuff that's been talked about, but like I saw Grapes of Wrath around this time. I saw that as a play version. And I know the ending of Grapes of Wrath, and I was horrified by the ending of Grapes of Wrath. So I know exactly why they're crying in that. So I liked having that. I I knew them already. I knew what they were going through instantly because I knew that story. Um, You know, I was in The Tempest in about 2005, kind of after, after, during college and stuff. And I got like an acting award and all this other stuff. So them doing the kind of musical theatre stuff was, it brought up a few things as well and proms and, and, and things that we we have in the UK, it's quite um, quite familiar to me. And you know, I, I was in school when they announced like nine eleven, which I talk about quite a bit. Um, and again, the technology and the way we talk to each other and those those awkward moments, um, you know. And I could I could see myself in Lady Bird as well. Like there's a lot, and you know, I can see maybe my sister's relationship with my mum or, you know, my relationship with my dad or my relationship with my mum a lot. There was a lot to to grab and hold on to. And and again, it really took me back. Like it really like just made me think of like, um, like I saw, I saw a memory today, which kind of also took me back on my Facebook. And it was like, it was like proper emo Dan, which was like, by text, how could you? which was somebody who broke up with me via text. So I was like, oh, very emo at the time. Uh, but again, it's, you know, it's a big deal to me. And it kind of, again, there was stuff I've I've not thought about in the way I felt. And and this film kind of brought it brought it all up for me. And again, like when I did the the poem for Alison and where I'm from, I talked about my mother and all the kind of sacrifices she's made and how I'll never be able to repay her or, or make it, you know, make a, a sizable chunk or, or difference or, um, but, you know, I appreciate every little thing she's done. Yeah. We've, we've fallen out. We've had arguments, we've had disagreements, same with my dad, but you know, there is that un, un dying kind of love throughout even though you know things are difficult and things become you know problems and we're not always completely honest and again it's a a case of trying to find the right way to communicate um so yeah i i i had a really really interesting journey with this film and i'm so glad you and allison kind of introduced me to it i'm glad you enjoyed it i I, speaking of the Grapes of Wrath, I think the opening scene of this film, just to sing its praises specifically, it's an incredibly skillful, I think the whole script is very skillful. And if you read anything about the film, she wrote the script over a period of many years and it was much longer and then was condensed. And um, And I read something where she talked about how when people think it's autobiographical, it feels like an insult to her because she's like, oh, I worked so hard on this. Like, please don't think I just cribbed from my life. And I I thought that was interesting because you can still work very hard and write about yourself. But I thought that was an interesting um, point of view. But the opening scene, they're in the car. Well, it opens with them in bed together, the mom and the daughter. And um, just that that visual of them and also facing one another, which you really can only do with someone you're so close and intimate with. And um, and then they're in the car sharing the grapes of wrath and crying about it. 
And then it quickly transitions into like their list of arguments, you know, and it's about who she is, who she wants to be in the world, wanting to be where the artists and writers are, arguing about what jobs are, what's a career class. I mean, it covers so much territory that the movie is going to be about. And you're not aware of it if you've never seen the film before, how expository this actually is because it's so real. And for me, that scene is one I would study if I was teaching a film class because it tells you what the whole film is about. And then she is so angry, she throws herself out of the car. (laughs) (laughs) So you know right away that Lady Bird, which is a chosen name she wants to be called, her birth name is Christine, and they're arguing about that as well. And that Lady Bird can be a bit dramatic. And I think that that is sort of the the squeeze of lemon that like, that's why this isn't too twee because this film does deconstruct the whole idea of sort of these periods we go through and it does it so well. She's different people depending on who she's with and who she's dating. And, and she, she doesn't know who she is. And I appreciated that so much because I think so many of us go through that, like, what is the difference between loving somebody and loving what they love because they've opened up your world to something new and becoming what you think someone wants you to be so they'll love you? And where is that line and how do you find it? And I think in a way that's that's what the movie's about for me, really. All these different relationships she's navigating and how do you find relationships that feed you and also feed the the you you not the person you're constructing to be loved and so that's why I this movie speaks to me beyond the coming of age because I think that's like how do you teach that how do you live that because that is such a huge struggle I I have found in my own life we're nodding which isn't great uh yeah not not great not great (laughs) audio not great audio content um I, th- I think you what you were saying about this film, again, it's not the usual fare and we're not getting to see them as much as as we used to, these kind of yeah. kind of more indie kind of tales. Again, it's it's not even there's not really a plot to to certain degree. So it's kind of just a slice of life, a, a a set amount of time. I think it's a is it the space of a year, I believe. I think roughly. almost a year, yeah. Yeah. Al- almost a year. And we see the kind of I guess of the... it's about a year. Almost yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because she starts her senior year and then she mm. starts her freshman year of college at the beginning of the yeah. Or university as you call it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh and then she she goes off and uh, it's almost like I can see why Rhea revisit the, revisits this so often because I think it is quite I think the word I'm looking for is kind of nourishing. Mm-hmm. I find it quite nourishing. You know, it, it's it's light, it's fun, it takes itself seriously, it's funny when it needs to be, it's heartbreaking when it needs to be. Um, you know, it's it, like when it was over, I didn't even realize it was finished. I went, oh. yeah, because it's it, yeah. again, again, it doesn't have an ending because it's again just a slice of someone's life, and it was. It's it's so hard to kind of for me to formulate words because I have so many feelings, but I don't have enough words to get them out. Um, well, I think you're talking about the tone as well. Hmm. Like the tone of the piece is is very hard to do. She makes it look so easy here to move between, like you say, emotional moments, comic moments, and for it not to feel like you're getting whiplash. Like, okay, whoa, we were just like having this really quiet moment and now the football coach is blocking the tempest which is a huge like laugh out loud scene. Right. And, and most of us can relate to having like different adults in our lives who like cannot read the room, not because they're not nice people. They just don't have a freaking clue, you know? And so it's, it does these, it does these transitions like so well and uh, makes it feel believable, makes it feel like a slice of life. Um, but it's it's actually more than that, which is the thing that is really hard to accomplish that they do here. It's a it's a it's a it's a thing. It's a roller coaster. It, it did things to me. This film. It did things to me. What oh, bits good. Did you cry at? What bits did you cry at, Dan? I didn't cry, but I I I, I felt it down in my soul. Um, <laughs> I I felt you know there was there was a moment where Lady Bird kind of um, kind of wanders off from her her established friends group and the kind mm-hmm. of maybe the slightly nerdier kids or off kilter or maybe they're a bit more kind of 
almost fundament a little more fundamentalist kind of you know straight laced kind of catholic a little bit uh, <laughs> i think her friend is actually not catholic yeah well and oh, that's, that's right. i think that's one of the most interesting things so julie is definitely not yeah. catholic does no. not buy into any of the religious stuff at their school yet jenna the rich kids uh queen bee who who Mm. has a developed body is you know considered very beautiful is sleeping with boys very much is you know when ladybird yeah very traditional when ladybird Mm. says things that aren't within what jenna sees as being traditional values she's really shocked and she doesn't understand it there's that line when she says i don't understand why anybody would lie about where they live and i'm like i mean one line Mm. tells you so much and speaks mm. volumes and and is saying so much that it's fantastic i mean and that's the beauty of the writing of this film is that you know i i could study like you Alison. there are just certain scenes certain lines that i could just study that i would want to study that i'd want there to be a whole thesis about mm-hmm. and i think that's why it's it's so for people who watch it and love it, it's so beloved because it is something that you can absorb and think about and go back to, think more about that you want to study. Um, I forgot what my original point was. Um, well, I think we were talking about how actually the quote unquote popular kids are the ones mm. who are more traditional. Yes. Yeah. And the yeah. ones who are quote unquote nerdier are mm. actually, you know, not as conformist as mm. the popular kid. And and that was certainly my experience in school. I didn't go to mm. Catholic school, but like I love and I also love this movie in that it really treats all the characters with some amount of care. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like we are ever laughing at Jenna, which oftentimes the Queen Bee is presented as like a very unlikable person because that's maybe how we felt about the queen bee when we were, you know, like she must be a terrible person, right? No, she's just like normal, regular girl who wants to live in Sacramento. Mm. And there's like nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly lovely life to have. Mm. And I like that the movie does that. And I also think the movie does such a good job of capturing how wisdom and insight can come from all over. Like it isn't just like we have the sort of godlike character who dispenses wisdom, which is a really common narrative trope. Like we have a character who's going to tell us everything we need to know. It comes from all the different characters and in ways that are not even necessarily intended, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that is how life functions. Like I was thinking of lines that really stick with me, Rhea, and it's when the nun and Lady Bird are together and they're talking about, um, isn't attention and love. And she says, well, aren't they the same thing? Mm. And because that is definitely the kind of love her mother shows her, right, is attention. Because we see her altering the dress. We see her trying on dresses with her. And that is her form of love because she's not capable of being more demonstrative. Um, and I just, the, when it, that I cried. If you want to know times I cried, that's one <laughs> of the times I cried when she says that because. I think that line definitely hits differently when you're um, loving someone as a parent or a partner that lots of times love comes out through attention because words can just be words. Yeah. And sometimes the words are difficult to find as we see. Yeah. As we see with her mum. Her mum, you know, is in a really important job and that job you can tell it's important to her the way she treats the priest when he comes in and she's talking to him the way, you know, she's picking up double shifts. Yes, they need the money, but, you know, she's also really clearly dedicated to her work, but she can't translate that at home into, into words, into bodily comfort. It's exactly what you said. She, 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 loves in the same way as when she's at work which is helping people trying to fix people and she's doing that like you said with the dress with uh all all those you know she's she's doing the eggs and lady Beth's like i want to do the eggs i want to do the eggs but it's like no i i'm doing the eggs this is me giving to you and obviously classic ungrateful teenager (laughs) (laughs) ah i gotta love teenagers i was one i know yeah yeah. Uh, and 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 it's so much that is it's the unsaid stuff that th- this is a film you have to watch it is you know i advocate doing that for 
almost all media that you're engaging with. But, you know, there are some stuff we junk on in the background and we still enjoy it. You need to, for me personally, I need to sit and absorb this film. I need to watch it. I need to have some time afterwards to think about it. Um, and like I said, just for me, revisiting it, I get something new on every watch because it's just done so skillfully. It's just, it's a really accomplished film. And I think when we went to see it for the first time, so we, uh, not anymore, got a child, don't get to do it as much, but uh, in the award run up, we go and watch all, used to go and watch all the award films. And obviously everybody was talking about this film and big film geek. So since I think it came out, it was Toronto first, I think I may be making that up. I'll have a quick look on Wikipedia uh, or check my notes for <laughs> once, which I always ignore. Um, oh, it's Telluride. So yeah. T, that's fine. It works. It's the same thing. Like so, we <laughs> so you know we we kept on hearing so much, so much about it. So we, I think it was the moment it was released at the at the BFI uh, in London. We we're like going to watch it. Knew we we're gonna like it. Both you know fans of of Greta Gerwig, and so we're like gonna go and watch it. But we kept everything minimal. We we'd done a bit of a tonya, and we hadn't really wanted to engage too much because we wanted to go in fresh. But you know it was billed as like this coming of age film. So like we love that sort of stuff, and it is so much more than that. And I remember leaving, and we couldn't stop talking about it for literally for days. And that's not me exaggerating. It was you know when when can we see it again? When is it going to be out released on digital? And then the moment it was, you know, we we dropped that twenty quid or whatever it was at the time, so we could watch it straight away. And it, for me, it's that kind of film. I know for some people, this film probably doesn't feel exciting. <laughs> But this film, this film does excite me. Watching it, I feel excited. You know, my other half is like, "Oh, well, you're getting to watch it. You're getting to watch it without me." And it's like, "Yeah, I am." Tough luck, ha ha ha. You know, it, it, it really. Again, I just completely lost my point. Look at your notes, Ria. Um, like, I just feel like there's not much out there like this that fulfills something that I need in the media I'm consuming. And I, and I think that is, there's, there's always so much to talk about because nothing is wasted. Really every line works on multiple levels and it's saying so much. And I don't, didn't know, I really wanted to say this in the conversation. So I think I'm going to say it now. Um, my husband and I have been talking about, and he was listening to a podcast and we were talking about how independent film directors now are, and they always have, but to a great extent are now getting snatched up to do big budget films like Barbie like Ryan Coogler doing Black Panther. Like, I mean, you look at the Marvel roster and they're generally independent filmmakers. And so there isn't like a Wes Anderson of, of a younger generation or Tarantino, he's even older. And I'm sad. Yeah. Like, I, I am sad that I don't get to see Greta Gerwig's film about marriage or motherhood or f- adult friendships or because there's one Nicole Hole of Center and I love her. And I love her latest film, but I wish there were more. And I am, and I feel like there is an empty space where these films would live. And, Mm -hmm. and I, I mourn that they don't exist. And and I understand why they want the big payday. I don't Mm -hmm. begrudge them. Like I get it. You want your money, go get it. That's fine. But I, I do mourn the loss of these stories not being told. I think I think as well because well everything that's going on now with the the writers strike and the actors yeah. strike, um, you know there's there's things that are just they're, they're removing things from streaming services because yeah, you know either they don't want to pay out the, yes. the residuals or it's that it doesn't do very well or nobody's watching it so quick get it off save some server room or whatever it is, but because of that now these little indie films or even these kind of cult classics aren't being found because there's not a space for them, there's not room for them, unless they do, you know, gangbusters in the awards ceremonies, more than likely nobody's going to hear from them and they're not going to put the amount of money into the marketing for them to be found. And it's, it is really sad. And you see them around award season and then they disappear. It's like, for me, every time we talk about watching a film, I have to go through the like bazillion streaming services. (laughs) Like, are they any of them? This I found on a library site, which I was very excited by, but it shouldn't be this hard to watch films. And it feels like even though there's this illusion of saturation, it's like water everywhere, but there's none to drink. 
That's how I feel about it. It's like, there's tons of movies. I don't want to watch these. <laughs> like, I want to yeah. watch <laughs> the other ones. It's, yeah. it's interesting. And that's, yeah. that, I mean, that's, that's my exact problem with, with films and TV shows at the moment. And mm. Yeah, the conversations yeah that we're having with people there's a ton but it's all the same thing and there are other stories out there and I'm not doing it to try and be different or be like I'm not like other people but I, I'm just having to mo- move myself away from these things these things ironically used to make me different uh 20 years ago when none of my friends enjoyed any of these things and I <laughs> And I had nobody to talk to about it. And, I, you know, I love that people still love these things. That's great. But I am having to move away from them because I don't feel nourished by them. I don't feel challenged by them. I don't feel that they're bringing anything to what I want to watch or read or engage with or, you know, play or anything like that. And I just, I, I have limited time. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to watch more ladybirds I you know I want to feel something see you hurt my feelings by Nicole Holf Center if you've not seen that film it is very satisfying and and it did they make me think of each other because they're I I think I'm saying stating the obvious here but there just really aren't that many women filmmakers who yeah. have the space to make films about their lives um it has to be about something sexier or um, more violent or whatever. Like we can't just have stories that are about existing. And, and I think for me, if this film is underappreciated, of course, it's for the same reason that anything that is made by, you know, non-white cis straight men, it's just because, you know, white stress, cis stress, cis straight manhood is the default, you know? And, and I don't think we really talk about it enough outside of spaces where we're having these conversations, but, I think it's important to kind of like just take a moment and think about what your default setting is when you're watching media, consuming media, and and how quick you may or may not be to say, well, this is different just because it takes a different gaze. And this is somebody's life, Lady Bird. It's my life. You know, I it speaks to me. And I think it speaks to not just women. Yeah, and, abso- you know, I can I can agree with that. I absolutely yeah, I, I don't I don't relate to a lot of the things, and you know, I I can imagine what it was like. But I can't fully, you know, understand what that would be like at that time. Um, but I still there's still a lot there. I think Laurie Metcalf in it, as we were talking, with, is brilliant. She's for me, she's kind of the quintessential mum. One of the one of those actors mm-hmm. that are just, like not in a reductive way. I think like moms every- are great. Yeah, There's exactly. No, no, no. But I, Bring I don't. It at me. I don't. I, I don't. I don't want to say that she's just. Oh, she always plays the mum, and she's so good at it. But I, she, you know, she's like Andy's mum in Toy Story, I think. And mm. and there's, you know, I've I've just always seen her in that kind of role. You know, for better or for worse. But she always absolutely, one hundred percent delivers. And it sounds like the way they, again, the way they've made this film, it feels more like a play. Like Greta Gerwig is a big fan of theatre, musical theatre, and it is. And like Saoirse Ronan's character is very theatrical, very theatrical, <laughs> and uh, and you know she's really going for it in those auditions where everyone else is a bit like, oh, a bit oh my god! And I yeah. was so blown away by her audition because you don't know how she's going to be because lots of people who are very confident are not actually any good, which is mm-hmm. an interesting observation you get to later in life. You know, because when you're younger, you think if or I did. I think if someone's confident, they're good at Hmm. whatever they're confident about. And then later in life, you realize it's actually there's it's not a direct correlation, confidence Hmm. and skill. Oh, absolutely. Well, you can be confident. I can be confident in I can be confident on stage and perform and that. But then, you know, when I'm in an intimate setting with a young lady, I can be in bits. I can be an absolute (laughs) quivering mess. It's the confidence. It varies. It varies. You know, Um, you know, not. Did I have an awkward lo- deflowering scene in my own life? Yes, I did. Did it last very long? <laughs> no, it didn't. Oh you know, man, but it, he all, wasn't, all... it wasn't his first time. What's his uh, excuse? Okay, yeah, he's a he's a fuck boy. He's a fuck. Boy. He he is always so good at it. Yeah, he's got the, <laughs> I mean, he's got he's got, he's got that hair so, so perfect. perfect. He's like, oh, oh. 
like the like the things where like you know I I even when I when I was that age and I would like you know I'd greet someone or shake them even even to this day where I meet somebody and I make the effort and I'd be like hi my name's Dan great to meet you you know who are you blah blah, blah. and people are like um uh what who are you, you shake sorry hands. you know I I shake hands I love yeah, it's, that in the movies it's oh, just, oh it's weird hands. it's weird it's weird you shake hands I was like it's fucking not <laughs> you're you're fucking weird for not shaking hands you're the fucking weirdo you're the you, oh, I, I don't like those people I'm like oh I hate I hate those people that make you feel shit for making an effort like when you greet someone and yeah. try try to be fucking nice or, or, to make or just friends. do something that's normal when she shakes hands for me it feels authentic it feels yeah. like we are seeing the true christine yeah. that that's just yeah. what she does yeah. and everybody comments on it and it's like yeah. but that's her you're commenting yeah. not on the things that are clearly the facade but the true part of hers and it's just and it's great like it's just yeah. Well, and some of my favorite moments in the film are when she pushes back, like when she, when the, when the fantasy falls away with Chalamet hmm. and he starts saying like, you know, well, it's no big deal. I don't know why you're getting so upset. And she's like, you know, there are things other than war that are upsetting. And I just <laughs> love that she's says that to him. And like when she's in the dorm room with the guy who's like, oh my God, your music tastes is shit. Everything is greatest hits. And she's like, well, they're the greatest. And I think I have definitely been and I think any person who's been in like a quote a nerd space you know like an has been and as a woman I'll just speak to my experience like being told like how I like things is not adequate mm-hmm. how I experience things is not deep enough or serious enough and it's my experience and I love it when she pushes back just a little, which is so hard for her, her because she wants to be taken seriously in these spaces. And that also rang true for me as well. And I'm always so proud of myself when I'm like, no, fuck you. Hmm. I like this. It's okay to just like this, whether it's cool or not. Like, who made you the arbiter? The and patriarchy. Yes, obviously, because it's always coming from <laughs> these boys, which is very accurate. Um but I also just, I thought Chalamet's character was so well, you know, he doesn't believe yes. his money. He mm. smokes, oh. you know, and I just, I love that the people talking about all the kind money, of, yeah, he's talking about all the kind of horrors that money. are going on in like the Middle East. Like, oh, isn't it horrible? What's yeah. happening here? No, that's like, what he says to her when yeah. she's upset about him lying to her and gaslighting her and yeah, implying it, he was a virgin <laughs> when he's so clearly not a virgin. Mm. I think he's talking, he I can't, I can't, yeah, Gaza, like the Gaza Strip or something. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You fucking, oh yeah, I don't like him at all. Um, I, that's probably why I've, that's probably why I've, I've not like particularly watched any of the movies he's in because I've looked at him and gone, nah, <laughs> not, not for me. Yeah, because <laughs> probably, probably I've seen, probably I've seen, maybe I've seen clips of this or that's fucking hairy ass, and I'm like. I'm like oh, I, don't, I don't like the look. Of, I don't like the look of you. Um, and he also speaks French, which he genuinely does. But it's just like he really like checks every pretentious asshole. Box oh, absolutely! In yeah. an amazing the cigarettes, the French, <laughs> not believing in money when you're rich, yeah. bringing up your family challenges whenever anyone tries to call you on being an asshole. You know he's so skillful, and he it takes him no effort. And I just I thought it was brilliant. He he's very he's not even in the movie that much. And that's the other thing about the movie that's so impressive. There's a lot of characters who I care and feel engaged with and believe who don't have a ton of screen time. And that really speaks to the writing and the performances. Yeah. I was going to say, like, Laurie Metcalf isn't in it that much, I, w- I would think. Like, if you probably, if you like right. clock in her time on screen, you wouldn't think that. But her, her journey, her emotional kind of foundation for for um ladybird's story is there and it's solid and it's throughout and even when she's not on screen you feel her presence you're always thinking about how's ladybird going to explain this or how's she going to uh, how will her mum react to this decision or that decision or how is she going to navigate this like oh when the oh what's the dad going to do keeping this secret about the funding to to go to a school in new york how is her mum going to react to that or that stray comment about you know living on the wrong side of the tracks oh. it, you know, it's a flippant little thing. Like I've, you know, my my family there's been, you know, comments like that and or or in between friends where it's like it's been one comment and people like, I'm gonna put that in in a bag somewhere. I'm gonna keep that and I'm gonna bring that up at the right time when you you really have fucked me off. I'm gonna remind you of that. Um, which is fair. Like it's it like and and you 
and you you fit you kind of you kind of were worried because you you they're so similar even the hairstyle is similar the like you said like the opening shot is them facing each other like two sides of the same coin almost they are there and that's why they argue so much because they are quite similar and they are quite you know obstinate and they and they don't communicate the way the other one wants them to or don't say the right thing at the right time like did like the scene where they're trying on the dresses they're arguing and arguing and arguing and went oh do you love this one and they're like oh yes and she absolutely melts uh, <laughs> right after i think she told her i just want you to be the best version yeah. of yourself you mm-hmm. know when she says do you think i'm fat do you think this isn't do you not think this looks good i mean well mm. i just want you to be the best version of yourself you know it's like Ooh. no you just say you look great yeah, yeah. Like just you, say that. that's just what say you said you, you don't actually need to do this thing where you should on her um and i want to say about the wrong side of the tracks that is a, like that scene when lucas hedges says that to laurie metcalf is just uh it really hits hard and lucas hedges he's such a likable character i can't think of his name right now but um he's not in it much and he's he drops two bombs he's yeah. like such a nicer kid than chalamet but he still has that entitlement that this film meditates so well on without you actually noticing it, but mm-hmm. that entitlement where you walk into every space and you just think like everyone lives like me. So there couldn't possibly be anything weird about me telling this story about how lady bird said she's from the wrong side of the tracks. Come on, bro. <laughs> That's sensitive. Like to you, it's a funny anecdote to her. It's a source of shame. And that, and that there's no like clocking of, Everybody who's wealthy in this movie doesn't get it. Mm-hmm. What she is struggling with. They they and they don't. And I found that so real. Like when Jenna says, Well, I don't understand why anyone would lie about where they live. And the way that she fantasizes about that blue house. And if she lived in it, she would be happy. And it's just, I I thought it was subtly such a great film too about class. And I I was really moved by it. How how that shapes all of her decisions, but the, her love interests and the queen bee that doesn't even factor in. Hmm. That's not, that's not a part. They're not thinking about what things cost. It's, it's almost like we've seen that done a million times as well. We've done the, yeah. Oh, I want to be popular. I want to do this. And she does have that phase. And, and yes. I, I related to that as well. Cause I kind of cut up myself off from a friend group that I now speak to on like a regular occasion but I was like, oh, I want to be in the cool get kids and be accepted. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought I would want that. And and I could, again, I highly related to that that section of the film and that argument and that like. And again, it was it was quite a gradual thing to get back into that friend group. And it wasn't without sacrifice and time and, and attention and effort and love to get back in there. Um and they were more than luckily they were more than welcoming, but it was it was a big kind of deal for us to for me to get back to where I actually should never have left. Um and again, we've been to I've been to their weddings, you know, I've met their kids, all this other stuff. And 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 I'm glad that, that I still have those friends from from high school, from primary school. I don't have any other friends really from high school and primary school because they were the the right friends for that time in my life and since. So um yeah, that was just I, I just, yeah, that that was, uh, again, it brought up a lot of things, a lot of memories. Like, yeah. Th- things where I'm like, I don't even care about those things anymore. I don't even think about them there. It's the past. What is this? And then I'm like, oh, no, that's fresh. That's, <laughs> yeah. That, it's been 15 or 20 years, but it's <laughs> still fresh. And when she gets in the car to go to the prom and they all are just like, she's weird. Sweet. Oh, it's yeah. just like one line, but it's so, it so encapsulates all the insecurities and and really, she is unusual. But what is weirdest about her is that she's poor. That yeah. is the thing that makes them uncomfortable and that they don't know how to deal with. And you know I what, just, yeah, I thought it you was know, brilliant. You know, what I thought was really good. And you were saying it was kind of she's she's telling you what this story is going to be about without actually telling you and and like telegraphing it too early. Um, oh, the fact- not too early. Perfect. Yeah, but yeah, I didn't sorry. think it was too early. No, 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 no. No, that's <laughs> I'm saying that she's not doing that. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. She's, she is telling she's telling it. She's giving you like little just like snippets or kind of yeah. just it, it's like a little nice tease, not not too much. But like one of the moments that I thought was quite powerful after I what I finished the film was the fact that she her dad, she asked her dad to drop her off like like a block back, a block away from the school. And I thought, oh, 
she doesn't want him to be embarrassed. He's a lovely dad. He's a nice, you know, charming, sweet, sensitive guy. She just doesn't want dad there at the at the at the side hugging and kissing and all that. But it's only later we realize that the reason she does that is because she's from a low income household. And, you know, it really upsets the dad, but he won't say anything because he feels like it's, you know, he's, the you know, the mum says he's going to play the nice guy. He's going to play the nice guy all the time. Uh, and <laughs> I think I would be I think I would be that kind of dad if I was a dad, I think, um, for better or for worse. I'd be like, it's, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Tear rolls then down the home. cheek. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I would come home to your wife and be like, this thing happened. And I thought yeah. that, I mean, their marriage, I thought yeah. was really beautiful too when she asks you know is this gonna are you gonna divorce over this he's like no (laughs) don't be ridiculous yeah get over yourself (laughs) yeah and and the movie is also so good about how self-centered yeah teenagers are and how like you know the the world truly does rise and set on them and Mm. in their minds um and it did that with love but Mm. not so much love that it was like all right like it was critical it made her look i mean the whole scene where she gets into davis and she essentially says that her brother got in because he's Latinx. Oh um, yeah. Ooh. You know, she makes she's willing to make Lady Berg ugly. Mm-hmm. And and that's our also why the movie works because mm-hmm. she is selfish. Hmm. She's selfish. It's, as she it, should be at that age. Oh yeah. It's it's never like schmaltzy. It's never like overly no. sentimental. It's it's touching without being sentimental. It's realistic while still being hopeful. It's a wonderful mix of all those kind of I guess there's a big gumbo pot or whatever you want to call it of all those wonderful things just just going around and and somehow still kind of all these disparate elements still kind of working. It's it's kind it of does, and that's the thing that's amazing about it. So I have a question as an American. What did do you guys have ideas about Sacramento or like how did that hit for you? Because obviously I have lots of ideas. I've been there. I have family that lives there. Like, you know, it's a real place. I have no idea why she wants to leave. It looks lovely. <laughs> I mean, all the rich people seem super annoying. Um, and if I lived in Sacramento, I would clearly be from the wrong side of the tracks. And I'm OK with that, um, <laughs> which is something I, I actually want to come back to in, in some of the conversations we've been having. But I, I just think it I mean, it, it's beautiful. I mean, I know Greta Gerwig is from Sacramento. So and I don't know what her feelings are on it, but she knows how to make it look absolutely gorgeous. And again, it's hot. I looked it up and I was like, that place is hot. Yes. I don't like hot places, but yes, I really want to go and see it. Like it just like it just looks gorgeous. And I and I love that for for me watching it as a British person, you know, when we see California, we see LA, we see all that, you know, all those places. And for me, it was like I would like to grow up there. Mm-hmm. You know, being a teenager there looks really exciting especially with what she does with her friends her real friends not standing around in a parking lot you know and I feel I like the juice. <laughs> oh, the juice and you're thinking it's going to be somewhere so exciting it's lit and I love when she when she says what we're all thinking mm-hmm. which parking. normally I hate in a film but <laughs> this film is perfect so we've just gone from one parking lot to another parking lot <laughs> so good but you know any and like it is like a playground for her and her friends, for her and Julie. It it's just a world for them to be safe in, mm-hmm. and that's some you know I, one of the things I want to but maybe I'll talk about it now. I want to talk about it is, is the safety of this film. There's mm-hmm. safety for Ladybird to make mistakes and to fix them as much as a teenager can. And I feel like their childhood is really is really safe. I feel, you know, I love that never are they out and about doing fun, exciting teenager things. And I feel that there's danger. You know, I don't want to see that. And that's where lots of joy comes through in this film. But definitely the setting helps with that as well. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to get people to go to Sacramento, get Greta Gerwig to do a uh, little travel What's it? Travel yeah. advert for it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've, I mean, I want to go to Barbie Land at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm really, dig, I'm really digging. Not I'm a really, real place. Sorry. I know, I know, I know. Well, no. Malibu it, but, looks nothing like it's, that. It's real to me, record. damn it! It's real to me, damn it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I imagine, I imagine not. But, uh, but no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm buying it. But yeah, no, I, 
I, I've I've heard of Sacramento. I'm I'm aware of where it is in its kind of location, but I mm-hmm. I've not I can't say I've ever investigated it, been there or or done anything. But yeah, it does. I have to agree with Rhea. It does look like a real nice kind of you know it, it paints it paints a pretty picture of of Sacramento. I think and 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 like a nice wholesome. Um, I mean, it, it's as wholesome as a film gets with the word cunt in it. I will say. Um, I think that word can be wholesome. Sure, if you want, whatever. But <laughs> however you want to does, use that that word is fine. And it talks about abortion, which is yeah. highly yeah. unusual in American mm. films to talk and, yeah. that frankly about abortion and to um, and to question that whole line of thinking that is mm. very popular here um, about like if I had been aborted, I wouldn't exist, and like okay. Right. for you but um <laughs> my body's still my body and mm. that's got nothing to do with you you know and so i that lady bird that she speaks up is and, and they have a whole conversation about abortion it's just like the movie does so many different things and there's even a playgirl magazine which is something we talked yeah. about before we started recording we did we did um which I love. She turns 18 and she goes in and she gets cigarettes and a Playgirl magazine and a scratcher and which is like a lottery ticket. And uh, I just, I thought that was such a 18 year old thing to do. I was like, Oh, I should have, although I didn't want cigarettes or a Playgirl magazine. So just a scratcher. <laughs> and then just reads it in public. Just reads yeah, it in public. Smoking. I love it. Yes. Yeah, you know, with the cigarette hanging yeah. out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. And we get to we get to see a penis. Dongs. Yeah, dong time. The, hashtag release of the dongs. They were released. <laughs> Yeah, I for me, for me when I was a, when I was a young man, I was I I um I started puberty quite young, so I had a big healthy beard and uh, lots. I'm glad of that's where that went. Healthy, yeah, that was healthy, long, girthy beard. <laughs> um, and and uh, I I would go in. I would I would be the guy who got the alcohol. Most mm-hmm. people, I'd do it, and then people would be like, right, fuck off. Off you go. I was like, when, I was like, oh, we're not going to be friends then. No, oh, I see. You've used me. You've used me. But when I became eighteen, the the novelty, I lost it. Lost the novelty. I guess. I don't know. I don't know what it's. I don't know what it's like in the states. But you can buy alcohol at eighteen there. Oh, eighteen. Correct? Yeah. Yes, so here's twenty one. Mm-hmm. Um, and which is ridiculous. But um, yeah, there that definitely was happening. Where you're hitting up. I mean, have you seen Superbad? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah about yeah. that. Um, <laughs> And standing outside and asking people to buy you alcohol and all of those. A lot of time is devoted to the procurement of alcohol when when we were under age. Um, yeah. I mean, that's just being a teenager. True. And then it's yeah. the worst alcohol that you get as well. And you're just, oh, but you, you go for it anyway. WKDs. So, <laughs> reefs. It was reefs and hooch and Oof. Smirnoff oh. Ice back in my day in the park. So Sacramento for you, Alison. How? None of that. <laughs> oh, were you classy were you uh no we just don't have those brands i was just thinking uh, in my brain how the cheap brands don't go overseas okay. you know it makes sense of course it's like you aren't drinking paps blue ribbon or boone farms either yeah okay boone farms yeah it's like cheap like fruity wine boone farm like I once mean. i was on a date in college or i was going to a formal dance in college and they would ask you what kind of alcohol you would like and i said wine and he got me that it was like strawberry wine Oh. Ah. oh, I didn't mean that. But okay, I'll drink it because you're cute. Um, <laughs> was he worth it? I mean, he was all right. Yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to defame him. He was all right. I, I, no, I wasn't assuming that. Was so yeah. he, he, must, that. he must have been awful. <laughs> <laughs> I was just interested if if he was worth like the bad wine. Because when I was a young person, I was like, Reused yeah, you're cute, again. totally. I was like, sounds, sounds fantastic. You're cute. You bought great but i drink now, zimas like... so i don't really think i can like do you have zimas did you have those okay you didn't have those either those are like a malt <laughs> beverage that was like uh, fancy you know it wasn't okay. like malt liquor but mm. it was it was just like repackaged and re like made bubblier and different but um yeah so i didn't i didn't have great taste and then i i didn't i pretty much didn't drink very much after high school i mean college i did a little but i'm not i'm not good i'm not good with it it's not good with me. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that's, that's my, my PSA. Go. I'm not good with it. Um, and neither is Lady Bird. About Sacramento. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sacramento. Yes. Tell us. So for you, what's it like watching it? 
I mean, I thought that this was an accurate, like it's a love letter to Sacramento. And that is actually what she and the nun are talking about when she says mm-hmm. art, attention and love the same thing. When she's talking about her essay about Sacramento for college, I thought it was like, to me, it's the state capital, which was arbitrar- arbitrarily chosen because San Francisco and LA had so much beef. They could choose either one of those. So they picked this place. And yeah, it's a pretty spot. I thought it was like, I thought it was sweet. I have family there. I have lots of friends who are from there and live there. And I'm like, have you seen it? What'd you think? You know, that was one of the first things. And they all seem to really like it because it felt like true to their experience. Cause I think it still, especially then retained a lot of its sort of small townness. And, um, and that's not something that we have here in Los Angeles. Um, so I, I thought it was, I thought it was sweet. I love seeing movies that are about different places. Love reading books that aren't just LA, New York. Like, you know, because this is a big country and it's fun to hear. And also I thought when she goes away to college, just when she says she's from Sacramento and the guy keeps saying, huh, huh, huh? And she says San Francisco because that definitely would happen in college. I went to a school in Chicago and I would meet people. I was, I lived in Colorado at that point. I went to high school in Colorado and, but I had grown up in Southern California and people would always say they were from LA, like regardless of like, you know, Southern California is a very, is a vast place. They would say Los Angeles or San Diego, almost always LA. And I'd say, but like where, you know, exactly. And I mean, nine times out of 10, they weren't from LA. Like, so there is this sort of desire to like, why do we fantasize about big cities? Mm. Why do we think they're where we should be from. And I don't, it's, it's an interesting, so that touched on that. I think many of us have had that moment of asking someone where they're from or being asked where we're from and saying, Oh, LA. And I do it now. And people ask me, where am I from in LA? And then I say, well, I'm from LA. And then they like, want to know what freaking walk I live on, you know, to like prove it. And I'm like, do you want to see my like license? You know, like I I live in Los Angeles, a huge place. Millions of people live here. So it's a funny, I don't know. There, that was in there with the class piece, I thought. I think yeah. that is the class piece. Yeah. And I think like it didn't say it like outright, but obviously there was a lot going on there with politics as well. Like yeah. she only once says when Julie says that line, she says, don't be so Republican. When she says that one line, that's mm-hmm. the only thing that kind of hints at that Jenna and these people are Republicans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that Lady Bird is a Democrat. Yeah. She wants to go to the big city for that reason. But it's never explicitly stated, and that is sort of under. That's that's there. That's the subtext, I think, too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel that when she's talking about colleges and she doesn't want to go to college, that's. I think she says it's like thirty minutes or something like Davis. that. Davis. Yeah. yeah, and Which... and for me, it's for me that's where the the politics hit. I'm like, I know exactly why she doesn't want to go there. She doesn't want to be with these same sort of people. She wants to be with people mm-hmm. who think more like she does. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, that yeah, that's that's definitely the strongest. Yes. <laughs> moment and Davis yeah. is an yeah. agricultural school. Yeah. So well, when, and again, she says that. Know what Davis is. You and know, she it's says like... that, which is great for the audience. And again, when she says that, you're like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> and it's an excellent school. Um, so <laughs> it was just <laughs> all of that sort of also like as a Californian, it was just it's a fun, like. I don't think anybody ever really talks about hmm. that stuff, even though it's something that we are talking about a lot, these different colleges, especially when you're a teenager and when you have a teenager. And I'm sure it's the same thing with England. There are probably conversations like that. I think I think I, I I come from St. Anne's, which is a small town near Blackpool. Blackpool's kind of famous, got its own tower and everything. Um, and I tend to... That, that's what I, that is how you just describe Blackpool. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> It's got its own tower. Go its own tower, you know. Uh, it's average. It's, it's you know three piers. Fuck you, Brighton. Uh, <laughs> got three of those. Uh, just just for Americans, Blackpool's pretty legendary. Yeah, in, it was a holiday England. seaside resort. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, yeah. isn't it? Pl- Maybe place okay, okay. Visit? I'm, I'm not. I'm not Greta Gerwig. I'm not painting the best. I'm, I'm not painting the best picture of Blackpool. But like it, it was in he uh, Tim Burton came and filmed I think it's Miss Peregrine's Weird Kids or whatever mm, it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it wasn't but, called that, but that's no. what it's about. I mean, it's basically that though, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think they're called school. peculiar actually. Oh, peculiar. Okay. Yes. Of, 
<laughs> yeah, but, but I like them. I like them. They're I like them. They're good in a weird way. In a weird, okay. in a good way. Anyway, but yeah, I kind of there was a lot of times where I'd be like, "Oh, I'm from St. Anne's." Like, where the fuck's that? Blackpool. It's it's Blackpool. Mm-hmm. You know, it's because just because it's quicker, it's easier, and it's it's shorter conversation mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. than trying to explain where the logistics of it is. Um, now there was a there was a trope in this film. Like a lot of these tropes, uh, I don't really like when it's used. Mostly in kind of rom coms, this particular trope. But I think this film actually did it in the best possible way with a different kind of love. And that's the running through the airport motif at the end. I was absolutely devastated at that moment because it was like, you know, it's not this like, oh, will they, won't they, shitty rom com. It's a genuine. Hey, can we not about, shit on rom coms? I don't. I'm not saying all rom. <laughs> I like rom coms. Rom coms make me cry. I'm just saying there are some particularly bad rom coms out there. You, Rhea, have reviewed a lot of them on the Pop Gorillas. Uh, I know you enjoy the shit ones as well. But f- for me, like the a lot of them can fall flat. And I think using that idea, but applying it to this again mother daughter love relationship was far more powerful than most of the times that trope has ever been used. And just... she misses her. Yeah, and that's even more devastating because she she had a chance. and She still yeah. has her emotional catharsis because he's there, yeah. the father, to hold her. But it's like, she missed it, which is honestly how those airport scenes should go yeah. every single time. Mm. <laughs> you miss them. You waited too long. You're an idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't leave things the till the last minute. You know, like this should be the life lesson, not definitely leave it to the last possible moment. And then, <laughs> and then like just run after them. Like, no, do not do that. Say your piece. And I was grateful that she didn't catch her because she yeah. was a real bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she gave oh, her the silent treatment. And I feel like, and I'm using that word how I really feel because she, she used the silent treatment against Lady Bird. And I think there's more and more conversations about how the silent treatment is abuse, mm-hmm. but that was not something that was talked about when I was younger. And, Mm -hmm. and I thought that the mom says, you know, well, when I was your age, she was getting the shit beat out of her. She doesn't use those words, but that's obviously what happened to her. So she, she feels like she's not doing that. And so what she's doing doesn't hurt. Mm. And I think in this scene, we really see it's not only hurting Lady Bird, it's hurting her. Yeah. Yeah. And, Mm. and I loved that she didn't catch, it would have pissed me off if she caught her. Well, that's the Hollywood. So, that's the Hollywood version of that, isn't there? They, they do. Yes. They do reconcile. They do have the hook, yeah, and she goes. That's that. And it, you got to work fun. harder. Yeah, exactly. Than that, you know, like you got to work harder. You just did some damage. Yes, you loved her, mm. but you also put your really damaged feelings ahead of hers, and you're the grown up. And what are the, what are the, what is this doing to the dad as well? Like I know. Like what's it doing to him? He's already like he's on antidepressants and other stuff. He's having and, a hard time, Dad. Yeah, yeah. fuck yes. me. Yeah, and that, yeah. She does it multiple times throughout the film, and that's what I find so interesting when Lady Bird's talking to her about oh, being ready to have sex mm. and about she's found her dad's medication mm. and just the way her mum speaks to her and doesn't tell her the truth or not or she she's so withholding the mm-hmm. way she withhold withholds information that would make their relationship better, that would make Ladybird's life better, that would make her understand more things about the world and her parents and relationships, which is apparently is what her mum wants. Her mum talks about how selfish she is, how she doesn't think about all of these things, but then she doesn't provide her, she doesn't provide Ladybird with the space or the respect to be able to talk about these things. And, you know, we see it again with the way she talks to when she's trying on the dress mm-hmm. and all of those sort of things that I love that they don't resolve it because it's true to the character mm. and, yeah, it's and it true. hurts yeah and it hurts it really hurts and Lady when... Bird's doing the thing where she's like I'm sorry I'm so selfish I, I mean that was I cried there like yeah, I'm so selfish honestly. please talk to me I anything and you can just see her just like <laughs> dissolving before you're like begging for her mom and her mom just won't give her an inch. And and she does that twice in the film and both times, but that last one, it's just brutal. And it's so clearly abuse and that it captures that really well, that abuse that you can sort of sweep away because yeah. no one was hit yeah, and no voices were raised. Yeah. 
And so she doesn't deserve the catharsis of saying goodbye to Lady Bird. She has to sit in the things that she's done, much like Lady Bird is having to sit in things that her mother has done to her. And that's just great. Like, not great as in like it makes me happy, but it's mm. true. It's real. You, I have not had, I mean, I, I love my mother so much more than anything. I would do anything for her. But the way she parented me is very different to how I want to parent. I've done a whole podcast on it with Jess. Um, I know. <laughs> go listen and it's to a it. wonderful podcast. Well, thank you, you very should. much. Literature the link for life. will be in the show notes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to talk it up more, but that's quicker. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> but just be nice to me because it's a very very personal episode and and for me what you know watching this I feel like Ladybird. I you know mm-hmm. I feel like there were times when I was not getting what I needed from my parents and they weren't able to take themselves out of their own selfishness to be there for me and seeing that on screen and seeing it feel real and not overly dramatic when ladybird's crying and begging her mum that is real mm-hmm. that is real it's not ladybird being in her drama class her theater group and it's you know so i feel this is like going to make me sound like a terrible person i find it upsetting when her mum's crying in the car but i also feel like good because you need to know the consequences for your actions you have put yourself in this position You've dropped your daughter off at the airport and you've not even got out in the car. You've not wished that she's safe. You may have written her all these letters and you might be worried that she's that he be, saved. That he that saved. She exactly. would never have she seen. She would never if see. Had, exactly. So you have to assume from her point of view, she's not written anything. Yep. She said nothing. She's just sending her daughter off to college with a cold shoulder. Yeah. And I just think you don't deserve forgiveness <laughs> I mean I, I I I don't think that's the right word but you know I I am satisfied that she has to be in the car and cry and doesn't get to have that goodbye with Lady Bird because we very rarely see realistic consequences for actions for parents as well and I think the fact that she's so present in this film the fact that she's so present in Lady Bird's life and she is she doesn't get forgiveness I mean she does from Ladybird sort of like she starts to come around she starts on something she leaves a message for her parents but mostly for her mum and I think that is true I think loads of us have unresolved issues with our parents we go off and we become different people and then well, we come back the thing. she leaves yeah she left a message that's great she left she's gone yeah. exactly. and I think her mom knew that all along if she got out, she'd be gone. And I think yeah. there's a there's such a large tug of war happening here and nobody is really talking about it. Why is she so, so angry that Lady Bird's going to college in New York? She wants it to be about the money. She wants it to be about her martyrdom, how much she's sacrificed for Lady Bird. And she's made those choices. Nobody else made those choices for her. And She's angry because Lady Bird is going to have her own life. And and she and Lady Bird knows that. And that's why she's so angry. So I I mean at the end I thought it was nice that they gave us this moment, but the reality is she's gone. She's mm-hmm. flown the coop. Mm-hmm. She's not Lady Bird anymore. She's Christine. Yeah, and I love that. It's nice. You know? It's so obvious when you watch it at the end when yeah. she says she's Christine and not Lady Bird. It's so obvious, but it still works. It's still yeah. really lovely. And you see her reclaiming herself by having that space away from her mother. Yeah. She's getting to reclaim who she is. Yeah. Speaking about consequences for parents, Alison has to go shortly <laughs> <laughs> to pick up her own child. Yes, um, it's true. So I, I don't want to, I, I, as much as I'm enjoying this conversation, as much as I'd like to carry on, we do have to come to an end. Um, is there anything else you quickly would like to say about the film or uh, convince people why they should see it, Alison? Um, I'm just looking at my notes real quick because I just scribbled things down that really struck me. And I just, <laughs> this is a really funny you can thing, always but... You can always send them to me like Lady Bird's No, this mom. is a funny one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just crumple. I got to crumple them up first. Crumple them up. <laughs> um, I just, some of the things, Dave Matthews Band. I don't know if that's a British, if that translates at all, but the song I've... Crash, it's another moment. It shows up twice in the 
film. And it obviously means a lot to Lady Bird. She and Julie like cry over it in the car. And then it comes back on when she's at prom and there are like the stupid song. And she says, I like this song. And it is like her declaration. Okay. Dave Matthews bands is shit on a lot here. So that was just a hilarious. And I've literally had that exact conversation with somebody. <laughs> so that was such a funny, like, I like this song, God damn it. And this movie is so good at that stuff. I could just read all the little lines. Like it's just, it rings so true and, but it's so watchable and fun. And I just, I love it. And I, and thank you for the excuse to watch it again and write down all the things I loved about it and talk about it with the two of you, because it's like, this is, this is the dream, right? You get to hang out with people that you like and talk about things that you love. And, and this movie is about trying to figure out how to get there in your own life. Like that's the path that Lady Bird is traveling, right? Like, how do I find my people and who am I? And I think that's something we all grapple with for our whole lives. Um, and I'm just grateful that I'm here now with you. Me too. I'm very grateful we could Yay. make the time to do this. <laughs> that's uh, the perfect end. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was gonna. I was gonna ask Ria. Have you got anything? Yes, you'd like please to ask say? Ria. Nah, yeah. I think I think you've, you've done it, Alison. It's not abnormal. nailed it. Nailed it. Def- successfully defended. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I mean, again, it it, it all is like hundred. It's like ninety nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes right. until until some prick came along. That's right. Some troll. He literally, he literally left a bad review to kill the the because it was the most successful film on Rotten Tomatoes. Not that I give Rotten Tomatoes that much credence in regards to like crit- critiquing films but that's still impressive regardless um so yeah he's and uh i've read some of the barbie reviews today and they're just as fucking disgusting i'll be honest <laughs> some of them are fucking vile i'll be i'll be honest really I've, i thought you were being oh, sarcastic like no no so no they're glowing no no they're no. disgusting no the, people obviously are the, that the way. worst the worst people are reviewing it and they're leaving really disgusting vile reviews it's um, very upsetting how much people use these spaces to just bully intimidate and and discourage people from telling their stories mm-hmm. and they go make your own movie then yeah if, sure. if you're so certain that this is trash, don't watch it. I mean, I, this is it. You can get me a very long rant about this because I have an MFA from a very prestigious film school. And we were not having conversations about who is your audience. And I spent years and so much money showing my work to people who literally could not give a fuck about it. And it was such a waste of time and it was demoralizing. And I wish that there was a way for people who don't give a fuck about things to not review them. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you think about Barbie. You don't like it. I want people who are Greta Gerwig fans to tell me what they thought. I actually don't need to know. I'm going to love it. But I just feel like, why do we continue to have spaces dominated by people who have no interest in digesting stories by people who don't look and act just like them? Mm-hmm. Why? It's Absolutely. garbage. That's my short version. There we okay, go. Right. Good, good. But you made it short. I'm glad. I'm very <laughs> glad. Um, Alison, where can people find you on the social media? Maybe oh, where the can social they, media. Where where can they find your comic book as well? Oh, Reburn. Love it. Just had a call talking about it. So um reburncomic.com. Also, you can just go to my website, Alison Shelton, which is A-L-Y-S-O-N Shelton.com. All the things are on there. I'm also on all the social medias, but mostly Instagram at by Allison Shelton. And I do a weekly poetry series where, where I'm from, inspired by Georgia Alliance poem, where I'm from, which both Rhea and Spider Dan have participated in and all of the Femme on Collective and Tony and Paul oh. and Mike <laughs> and, and Blake. And Blake. Okay. I think that's everyone. And Dave <laughs> in the fall. Um, so it's just a really beautiful series and i love it and i'm so proud of it and number 100 is happening very soon so yes so i think that's all the places thanks for having me dan my pleasure ria again you are part of the femon collective that's you, right that's you're too, all both of you well ria's gonna talk about it now. <laughs> don't worry about it don't worry she's here she's your backup she's gonna do it don't worry uh, this is it's technically my job as the producer okay I'm thank you again it, so, uh... <laughs> 
I actually, whenever we do viewers' questions, I usually make Alison do the little outro because I'm so terrible at it. But come and find us at Femon Collective on Instagram and Femon uh, in all your podcast apps. We talk about anything, really, but our major shows cover, cover uh, film, literature, TV, anything within the media, all with a female gaze. We seek to elevate work by women, female voices. Uh, we seek to... Oh, gosh, where am I going with this? Who knows? I've got to wrap it up quickly. Um, We seek to be (laughs) intersectional and basically just create a safe space for people to come together and talk about things that they love, but specifically around women and the work that women do. So come and join us and listen to our episodes. We're amazing. You certainly are. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Really worthwhile. Some wonderful journeys to go on. Talk about pregnancy and um, you know, lasagna pigeons, you name it. All a good a good range of stuff. Activism. Justice for lasagna pigeons. Poetry, filmmaking, you name it. It's all that. It's all that. It's all great, excellent content. And I enjoy every single episode. Um, you can find me at spiderdan and the secret balls.com. Uh, that's all of the stuff, all of it's there. All of the, the the things just there on the interwebs, you know, it's a big web of of stuff, content, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm doing the short version of this as well. Uh, so yes, and um, yeah, and I want to thank my Patreons, uh, all paying uh, for extra content from me, and you're going to get some more very very soon uh, when I find the time. But thank you, thank you, Alison, thank you, Ria. And thank you thank very you. much for introducing me to Ladybird. And I think it was a very good choice to have the Themon invasion be about Ladybird. I think it's very fitting. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.